We're filming at the Paradise Valley Jazz Party in Scottsdale, Arizona. My name is Monk Rowe, and it's a great pleasure for me to have Lou Soloff with me, who is one of my favorite players. And I think when I look at your resume, I'm trying to find someone who's been doing more versatile work than you over the years. Difficult. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I've enjoyed it. I've, I've really enjoyed the... Uh, I've enjoyed the... Uh, all of it. I have I? I've enjoyed the different things that I've done. Yeah. You stated in in a recent liner note that Gil Evans' gig was was the greatest one you've done. Does that still hold up? Sure it does. Yeah. Well, he was uh, he was you know I mean him and Dizzy. Were the you know two to me two absolute geniuses, and um, I was lucky enough to work with Gil for a long period of time, and I uh, was lucky lucky enough to experience what he was like as a band leader, which was basically never telling you what to play, uh, maybe giving you a little hint, maybe once a year, uh, but basically never telling you what or how to play and just using you or having you in his musical organization as long as you played the way he liked. In other words, he picked his musicians because to be creative and to and he allowed them to be creative in his band rather than trying to dictate to them how to play. Mm -hmm. um, he, he let us um, be ourselves and rather than tell somebody how to play he realized that he couldn't get the best out of somebody that way so if somebody didn't play the way he wanted he'd get somebody else mm -hmm. or if his child's style changed to something other than what uh, what somebody in the band was wanted to do the person would leave or he would get somebody else and that's where the versatility that I had from doing so many things came into play because it also opened my mind up to a lot of different kinds of music and so um, I was open to everything that Gil did. Mm -hmm. You know, even if I didn't understand it, I remained open to it. <laughs> and um, that's why it was my favorite job. Of course, along with the incredible freedom that he would give the band um, came, uh, you know, it wasn't as disciplined as a lot of situations. So there were many nights where the band really didn't sound terrific, but when it did, it was better than any band I ever played with. Wow, that's when it a did. lot. Yeah, yeah. You you said that uh, you started on the trumpet because it was shiny. Yeah, I th I, my conscious reason for picking up the trumpet was because it was shiny. <laughs> and uh, the odd thing is that I kept, that I, I don't know how you would put it, but I wound up liking a dull, straight, brass-looking horn. You know, as, as my horn got dull and brass, I liked it. Now I also have um, a beautiful, shiny gold trumpet that I like. I have two trumpets. Mm -hmm. um, both of them Bach trumpets, one an old one made in in um, New York City in 1947. Um, I got it secondhand about, oh, I'd say maybe oh, close to 20 years ago I got it. And uh, it's a magnificent instrument. Uh, but it doesn't have a lot of lead trumpet projection anymore. Hmm. It kind of mellowed and got darker and richer, but lost the lead trumpet projection. So. I found a trumpet that has amazing lead trumpet projection and also plays very well. If I didn't have this other one, I'd probably be playing it for everything. Mm -hmm. But I, I use that when I play strong lead, like with the Carnegie Hall Jazz Band or something like that. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's just beautiful and it's shiny. But I was walking home from college one day, back to the dorm, and all of a sudden I started to sing to myself, Roy Eldridge's solo from After You've Gone. 
And I sung it note, to note, note for note as I was walking home from school, and I realized that I hadn't heard it since I was five years old. Oh, my. And I said, wait a minute. I knew that solo cold from when I was five years old. And then I sung a Louis Armstrong solo or two that I knew from when I was five years old. And I said, that's why I took up the trumpet. That's why I took up the trumpet. And I was very fortunate that my grandmother and grandfather and my uncle liked those records because I, it just, that's what drove me into jazz and mm -hmm. that's what drove me into playing trumpet. I listened to Roy Eldridge and Louis Armstrong when I was a little kid. Wow. How much luckier can you be? Yeah. And all those years later, it's like all of a sudden that came out. That's really great. You know, and then of course I had other early influences, but those were very, very early. And those, now that I'm thinking about it and realizing it, those were the only two guys I heard very early mm -hmm. that I was aware of. Those two guys. Then later, I heard, you know, I got to be a big Dizzy Gillespie fan. And a little interesting anecdote of little humor for some of you college people. <laughs> when I heard Dizzy the first time, it was on a r record called Bird and Diz, which is still, a, it's around on CD. It's a wonderful record on Verve. So when I went to get the Dizzy Gillespie record, I went to Sam Goody's, and there was a guy who was notorious for knowing jazz records there. And he recommended that I get this record with Bird and Diz. So I got it. When I went home, I was listening for the birds on the record. <laughs> you know, and the music sounded like something from outer space to me. I could not understand it at all. I mean, you know, I could hear that Dizzy was a fabulous trumpet player, but I could not understand the music at all. And so, you know, if there's some music that you don't understand, Artie Shaw said this, if there's something that you dislike because it sounds very foreign to you, before you make up your mind that you don't like it, I mean, if it's something really of a different nature, anything, mm -hmm. whatever musical form it's in, uh, don't make up your mind after hearing it once. Listen to it maybe 20 or 30 times, then decide whether you like it or not. Yeah. When you get yourself familiarized a little bit with the language. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a different thing if you're familiar with the, the, the jazz language and you hear somebody play and it doesn't say anything to you and it's in, in a, a language of jazz that you understand, whether it be bebop or, or whatever, or, then you can make up your mind quicker. But if something sounds totally foreign and you just say, what is that? Don't, you know, don't turn your back on it until you explore it. That's good advice. I say. Yeah. You know. This um, first playing up in the Catskills must have developed a good uh, <laughs> sense of humor and uh, well, your questions reading are skills. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the playing in the Catskills? Yeah. You say must have developed a sense of humor? And I would think so. Or my father was in show business. Yeah. And my mother was a violinist in vaudeville. My mm -hmm. father was a dancer and a comedian. And uh, my whole family had a great sense of humor. And what's left of it has. Um, and um, I, uh, you know, I always loved the humor that Dizzy had in his playing. Clark has a lot of humor in his playing. Yeah. Um, and uh, to me, humor and <laughs> warmth kind of go together in a way. Um, Louis Armstrong, his playing was real serious, I mean, but, but he would lighten it up with his conversation and his, and his, uh, uh, his you know, persona, his, his, persona, his conversation, his singing, you know. That what the Catskills and all that experience did in, in the various different forms of music is it made me learn how to play the, these different things and decide what I really wanted to do. 
now I really only want to do what I really want to do at this point, mm -hmm. which is uh, basically more than anything else I like to improvise. I mean, there are some exceptional jobs. If somebody calls me to back up a great artist, I'll jump at the chance because I can learn from the artist. For example, when I played behind Frank Sinatra, I would do that at the drop of a hat any time I got called. Because all I would do is, <clears throat> first of all, playing the greatest arrangements. Yeah. And the same thing with Barbara Streisand. You know, you know, you listen to their phrasing and try to figure out what it is, what is, what is the thing that makes it go straight into the hearts of people yeah. when they sing. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing thing that very few people have. And singers, for the most part, have stronger than, influ that have stronger than instrumentalists because they have the advantage of being able to speak lyrics. Right. And of course, Miles Davis had an amazing way to interpret ballads on the trumpet. Just amazing. Uh, without lyrics, and more modern, more modern day, and more in a different kind of music. David Sanborn has an unbelievable melodic sense, and th this is what's always fascinated me. I mean, I'm rambling, but I suppose you want a little of that. Sure. What always yeah. fascinated me was more than the guys who could play a lot of notes or run a lot of changes, is the guys who could play a melody, kind of like a singer and move people, or play very simply and move people. That's the mysterious part to me. It, you know, because I always said, you know, oh, you know, if I heard somebody play a whole bunch of notes, oh, well, wow, well, he can do that and I can't do that. You know, oh, wow, mm -hmm. boy, I'd have to practice to be able to do that. But when you hear Frank Sinatra sing, or you hear Louis Armstrong play some simple solo, not his tough ones are pretty tough, <laughs> but some simple solo. Or you hear Dizzy play a beautiful ballad. I mean, you hear him play the other stuff and it's impossible. But you hear him play a beautiful ballad. Or Miles, many of Miles' solos, you say to yourself, I could play that on the trumpet, but why can't I sound like that? Uh -huh. You know? Yeah. Why can't I sound like that? What is. What? What is it? What is? What has he got? What, why can't you know? Billy Holiday's voice on Lady in Satin was, you know, not really so great anymore, and yet it's the most moving record that I've ever heard by a singer, to me. And that's another thing that I liked when I was a kid. That got right to me when I was mm -hmm. a kid. That record. And Sinatra always got right to me. Were you affected by the rock and roll scene that was forming at the time also? Yes. Yes, I was uh, affected by it, but I didn't pick up on it because I was advised by adults that it wasn't good music and that I shouldn't listen to it. Hmm. But had I not been adv adv advised by that, I can tell you that Rock Around the Clock, Blackboard Jungle, when that music happened in the beginning, that said, that really said chills up me. I loved that music. I really loved Bill Haley and his comments. I loved it. It moved the hell out of me. It moved the hell out of everybody. Do you remember that movie? Yeah, sure. And in the theater, how? It caused, you know, some riots in, in some places, too. I didn't know that. Yeah. I was just watching a thing on the TV the other day. I didn't know that. Yeah, actually, but, oh, more overseas though. But the m music was very moving, uh -huh. and and you know because it was basically out of R and B, and um, now, for example, one of the variety things I do, I mean, I'm thrilled. I just played lead with Barbara Streisand over in Australia on New Year's Eve of the Millennium. Wow, of the Millennium. It's a nice place to be, New Year's Eve, mm. and. Uh, you know, I just got called, Branford Marsalis called me up to play this show with Sting. 
Hmm. There were four horns, a great band made up of mostly R&B players. Um, and there were about nine stars on the show. Is this rainforest? The rainforest thing. thing. Yeah. Elton John, <laughs> Billy Joel, Sting, uh, Gladys Knight, Sam Moore, who lives here, from Sam and Dave, who lives mm -hmm. in Phoenix, um, uh, Tom Jones, um, Martha from Martha and the Vandellas, uh, Stevie Wonder sat in. He <laughs> sat in. And I'll wow. tell you, it was just thrilling. It was thrilling to play this music with these people. And, um, you know, all this, all this stuff goes into my music. Mm -hmm. It's all a part of my music. Gil Evans uh, made me aware of Jimi Hendrix. Even though I played on the same bill with him, back with Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Oh, yeah. I really didn't appreciate him at that time. Mm -hmm. And the Catskills. The Catskills um, sharpened up my sight reading. The Catskills was very good for that, very good for the instant, okay, there's another act tonight, there's another this, there's another that. I think everything is good to learn with, and it's good to have a wide variety of stuff to learn with. Uh, but then I think you've got to make up your mind what you really want to do. If you really want to be good at one area, you've got to make up your mind what you want to do mm -hmm. and have the nerve, because it takes a lot of it, to concentrate and to be a master, real master, or to try to be a master of one thing. You know, I mean, you see, it's a different, I mean, there's basically a different thing of being a working trumpet player, mm -hmm. which means, hello, uh, sure, sub over here tonight, yeah, wedding tomorrow night, sure, okay, block party, fine, uh, a jingle here, you know, recording date, there's one thing to being a working, a working trumpet player. And it's great, and it feels really good to be called for that kind of work. But it's another thing to be a working musical personality, where people hire you because of the way you play, not because of the way you play the trumpet, mm -hmm. but because of the way you play, because of the way you can play a song, because they like your style. The first, I mean, the first person who, uh, who made me aware of it very clearly was Warren Vache, actually, who I'm a great admirer of. And I was telling her I wanted, this was years ago, and I was doing a lot of studio work. And I said, gee, I really want to get, you know, better at playing jazz and this and that. And he says, well, he says, look, he says, he says, it's kind of hard to do when you play the way everybody else wants you to all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Gil Evans, of course, would state it as, uh, it's basically hard to be creative when you have to be professional. It's, uh, it's a different it's an meaning statement. to it. It's an interesting yeah. statement. Yeah. But when I was doing a lot of studio work, I would be inhibited in my jazz playing. And since this is for educational purposes, I figured I'd let that out. Yeah. But I do think it's good to learn all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I do. When you were um, in your early 20s then, you had a specific goal to be an all-around trumpet player? That was my goal. Okay. Yes. Well, you reached it, that's for sure. <laughs> well, I don't think I did, but, if, yeah, but really? uh, I mean, I think, um, for example, as I say, I'm doing this because it's an educational thing, mainly. I'm letting some things out that I wouldn't do on a normal interview. Mm -hmm. But I was always encouraged, although I, um, although I didn't have much confidence in it, 
couple of my teachers really thought I could have been a fine classical trumpet player. I mean, like, uh, you know, major symphony level. Yeah. Um, but the thought of auditioning and that stuff always frightened me. I was actually asked to audition for a major symphony and didn't go. <laughs> I wouldn't go to the audition. But um, so I never felt like I really developed the classical thing. Now that I realize what it's really about, I think I could do it. Because I realize that in the end, in any form of music, you know, to be hired, I mean, the reason I'm hired, for example, as a lead trumpet player for many people, or I was, and continue to be occasionally when somebody, you know, is not because I can play higher or louder or faster than somebody, but because somebody prefers my style. Mm -hmm. I think a, a, a big thing, if anybody is interested in playing lead trumpet, the most important thing is time, the sense of time. I think it's one of the most important things in jazz, too. Mm -hmm. I think the time is more important. I read it in Downbeat. Dizzy said it years ago. I think the time and the rhythm that you play is more important than the notes. Yeah. Uh, but it takes a while to figure that out. You know, the feeling is more important than anything. Uh -huh. But you know, <clears throat> if you if you play with 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 good solid time and a, uh, and a and a strong conception, I got my conception of lead trumpet playing from three guys basically, from Conrad Gazzo and from uh, uh, Ernie Royal, and then later I realized the magic of Snooky Young, uh -huh. who to me was the greatest jazz lead trumpet player that ever lived, is the greatest lead jazz trumpet player that ever lived, because he has the best time of any, he has better time than many than most drummers. It's unbelievable. I was hoping you'd say his name. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And, uh, you know, all you have to know, to find out how good his time is, just sit there in a band, have a four bar rest, and then have a quarter note on the first beat of the fifth bar. Like one, two, three, four, four, two, three, four, bop, like that. And you cannot figure out where to put it where he puts it. Because it's right in the right place. And you just can't put it. It's like the way Sinatra sings. <laughs> that's interesting. I mean, that's a really simple concept. You'd think that putting a quarter note on B1 somewhere would be, you know. Oh, and, 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 defined. Yeah, but an interesting story relating to your original question, which is, what was my goal? Well, I wanted to play every kind of music, every kind of music. I wanted to be able to play it, so I could play classical, mm -hmm. and, you know, enough to get to do some gigs, not as principal trumpet, but I could sit in a section, mm -hmm. and I could play jazz, and I could play lead, and I could play weddings, and I could play bar mitzvahs. And I could play, I'd done a Greek job, and I'd done this and I'd done that. But I'd never played rock and roll. Uh -huh. So when I got the call from Blood, Sweat, and Tears, I said, Ooh, well, I have to add rock and roll to my repertoire. And I think I might meet women. <laughs> so OK. <laughs> so I wanted to do it to meet girls. And I never played rock and roll. I wanted to add that to my repertoire of things that I could do. Yeah. Was it all that you expected it to be? After what I had been doing musically, it did not turn me on. Hmm. Not compared to what I'd been doing. Hmm. But I appreciated its place, and I don't think its place in 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 the history of um, of the music scene is really appreciated by I a lot of either. people, because it really did bring jazz back to a lot of the public. Mm -hmm it really paved the way for bands that really were much better than it. Bands like Weather Report. But without Blood, Sweat and Tears to open that door, I don't know how long it would have been before a band like Weather Report mm -hmm. could have been there. You know, it was, uh, it really did a lot for bringing, it was the first thing that brought a little bit of jazz sound to uh -huh. the mass public in a long time. Yeah. And for that, I'm very proud that I was in the band because of that reason. However, I was playing with I was playing with Thad Jones, Gil Evans, and Joe Henderson and Kenny Dorham. 
before I joined, and Clark Terry yeah. before I joined that band. And so what I missed was the sense of freedom that a real good improvising situation gives yeah. you. And for me, everybody's different. For me, my happiest is in a small band with a lot of blowing space because I love to improvise. And now I would say 90, 95% of the time, that is what I'm hired to do. I see. That's good. Was Blood, Sweat, and Tears a difficult group as far as uh, some rock bands have personalities that constantly... Well, let's put it this way. Um, marriage is not an easy thing for people mm -hmm. to live together for years. And married people, usually the husband goes out and he's working all day, and in, in today's world, sometimes the wife too. Uh, and you only see each other for a few hours at night and a few hours in the morning. With when you're in a band and you're on the and you're on the road, you're with these guys night and day, four or five days a week. And some when you're on, when you take a trip, you're with them night and day, seven days a week, except when you're sleeping. So naturally, personalities are going to grate on each other. Yeah. It also was a <coughs> cooperative band, which means that the only way to emerge as a leader of a cooperative band is by using all kinds of political techniques that are used in, you know, it's a bit ugly. Yeah. But it's the only way that somebody can emerge as a leader is by gathering the votes of others or this and that. It's... There was no leader, per se. There was no leader. So some more aggressive personalities emerged as bosses and squelched some of the more creative personalities mm. that were more passive. Yeah. And uh, I'm not even talking about my, uh, myself. Of course, I felt it in, in only, I felt it only in playing the same tunes over and over again, becoming prisoners of our own hits. Yeah. Whereas the, uh, what I'm saying is the real creative forces in that band were, was a particular arranger to me, uh, named uh, Lipsius. Yeah. I mean, Halligan also, but Lipsius to me was the prime creative arranger in mm -hmm. the band. And he was just, he was a, you know, kind of a shy, he is kind of a shy, laid-back sort. And, oh man, you know, he would bring in this chart or that chart. And instead of saying, okay, we'll do this, okay, we'll record this, it was like, no, nah, that's no good, no, that's no good. Hmm. You know, and finally he just stopped. Yeah, he had less arrangements on those records than uh, near the end, should yeah. have. Yeah, of course. Because he didn't, <coughs> he didn't want to bring something in and have it put down. Hmm. And he was the real, he was amazing creative energy in that band. Actually, so was Al Cooper oh. before I was there. Uh -huh. I loved his songs. Yeah. Um, but, it, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, I'm always of the mind that if, if a band is allowed to just continuously try to be creative, they're better off than if they have a hit and they try to keep following that formula. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm even of that mind with the Manhattan Jazz Quintet, which I'm in, which you may have heard of or may not. It's a band that's extremely popular in Japan, a jazz quintet. Mm -hmm. We made a record in the early 80s, maybe 84 or so. Uh, the record was projected to sell about 8,000 copies. Within, within several months it had sold well over, within a couple of months it sold over 80,000 copies and mm. shortly after that it went up to about 160,000 copies. And you know, when, when you're talking about a country the size of Japan, you multiply it by 10 to imagine what it would be like in sales here. Yeah. And for a jazz record, that's a lot. Well, now we're making our 24th record as a quintet. Uh -huh. We'll be doing that in May or June. 24th record as a quintet. Uh, our, we just did our eighth 
outgrowth of the quintet, a big band album, the eighth one. So that's 24, eight big band records. I did five solo records. Give you $125 if you can find one. No, no, I did five. <laughs> right. I, I did five <laughs> solo records out of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's five solo records, eight big band records, 24 quintet records, which will be shortly 24, uh, a couple of orchestra records, all stemming out of this, and plus many related projects, you know, with other artists. That all mm -hmm. came out of that for me. Wow. But nice. the downside of it is that the band, which is on a level where it still works in Japan, but not on that high level of hit that it was, mm -hmm. you know, back in the late in, and mid-80s, uh, they basically, and I'm not the leader, they basically are of the mind that we still have to follow the original formula of the band. And I think if we had just changed it radically, we would be getting, we'd be enjoying the music more <coughs> and getting better critical approval. Uh -huh. But, you know, I'm not the leader. What and, is the uh, format? I mean, the, format is, well, the format was originally, and still is, um, at that time jazz was getting very, very, uh, very avant-garde in Japan and yeah. very out. Mm -hmm. And there was a feeling by some people that a group had to come together and play some of the straight-ahead stuff made popular by some of the great groups like Horace Silver, Art Blakey, blah da 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 yeah. in a little bit of a different way. And so we did an album, and it was, outside of Blood, Sweat, and Tears, I have never been involved in a band that had that kind of reaction to it. Never. I mean, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, of course, was in a class by itself. That was a, you know how big that band was at yeah. one time. Yeah. Uh, that, was a, that was a real trip. That was like, we were the second biggest band in the world to the Beatles. Uh, but this band was the, you know, very far removed from that kind of success, but more, way more successful than anything else I was with outside of BSMT. And uh, this one was called MJQ. They call it MJQ. So maybe if I change my name from Lou Soloff's Food Group to. LSFD, <laughs> yeah. maybe something will happen. We need you an know? anagram or something. We need, we need a little, uh, yeah, some initials. Maybe pain. that'll do it. <laughs> anyway, just <clears throat> just to let you know where my head is at with music. Yeah, uh, I like to improvise in many contexts. I like uh, to play straight ahead jazz, but I also just as much like to play more of a world beat, now music in a mm -hmm. way, which is, um, you know kind of funk fusion, uh, R&B branched. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's, uh, in other words, there's a whole area of music that, and some is finally being creative, that has, has some of the complexity and intricacies and depth, that's the word I'm looking for, mm. of the straight ahead music. The hard thing about the uh, music, you know, based on some kind of electric instruments, is that oftentimes volume is a negative factor. Because if the volume is so high that you have to play loud all the time to be heard, it's very hard to think creatively. Yeah. Because part of music is, the, is, is having that dynamic thing from, you know, from five P's to five F's and being able to use them, being able to change it, and women have the whole band come down and up because they can hear you. But if an electric rhythm section is playing, except in very few hands, these things can't happen. Yeah. Because the instant control over the volume is not there as much as the others. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the biggest problems with that. But talk about an intense groove. <laughs> should have heard you should have heard that band behind the R&B acts. We had there were uh, 
two guitarists. There was Steve Crapa and Nile Rogers. And Steve Crapa invented a lot of that stuff. And yeah. Nile Rogers is fabulous. And <clears throat> the bass player was Nathan East. The drummer was Narada, Narada, uh -huh. Michael Walden. Wow. And the, uh, I can't pronounce his name right, Greg Fillingrain. Fillingrain was Fillin the right. piano player. Also, Leon Pendarvis was a piano player. And a guy named Frank, can't remember his last name right now because I just met him. And it was an astounding rhythm section. Astounding. And there was a great percussionist there, mm -hmm. too. How much time did you have to get this whole thing together? We rehearsed, by the way, you never saw such intensity in, in musicians. Hmm. You know, and everybody was working for, basically working for the uh, Rainforest Charity. Mm -hmm. it, was either, it was either a nice nominal payment but not considering the hours, but it was it was a nice nominal payment. It was a a generous nominal payment, or else twice this payment was offered in uh, in in value of tickets and things like that, and you know, and highfalutin dinners and stuff yeah. like that. Um, uh, it, but. Even though many people donated their services totally and took just the ticket and the dinner, many people did that. I never saw anything like it. We rehearsed for 13 hours straight the first day. There was maybe a half hour to 45 minutes taken for lunch, a half hour to 45 minutes taken for dinner. But outside of that, there wasn't any breaks during wow. the day at all. And the next day we did ten and a half hours. Man, who put all the music together chart-wise for the horns and all that? Well, they, it was difficult. Uh, there were 30 songs. There were several guys that did it. Frank, the keyboard player, did some of it. There was another guy on the West Coast that at the last minute was called in to. Uh, we basically, since they were covering a lot of records, you know, in other words, like they would do uh, recordings, famous R&B recordings done by other artists. Uh -huh. Like, you know, like it was an homage to rhythm and blues. Yeah. So Sting wouldn't, I mean, Sting did uh, one of his own songs, but, he all, but uh, for example, they would all do real R&B songs. And we would, uh, uh, the charts were basically taken off the records, which was, you know, just time consuming. Mm -hmm. But it all had to be done, so they got various people to do it. And then, here's one for you all students there. And then the singers changed the keys on many of the charts. And then they changed them again. Oh, no. And then they changed them again, and then they changed them again, and they changed them again. I'm telling you, we had to read things a minor third down, a major, uh, a, a fifth up, a uh, tone down, a whole tone down, a half a step up, and the band did it like that. The whole band. That's intense. Yep. I guess that's why they had the All-Stars, huh? The yeah. band just did it's, it like wow. that. It didn't it's matter. Amazing. The key was just played. God. It gets you on the edge of your seat, doesn't it? <laughs> you don't want to mess up. Yeah, not in this Nobody way. wanted to mess up. Yeah. And the band was so good that the, that everybody, almost everybody, messed up a little just getting listening to the other people. Yeah, right. Mm. But it was really, it was really an educational experience. It was, it was really something. But I still think about some of the singing I heard. Yeah. Wow. Let me take you back to a couple okay. things in your career. Uh, you did a thing with Ornette Coleman, Celebration, 89, was it? Probably. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I did it, you mean the thing with the Kronos Quartet? Yeah. Right. Yeah. It just seems like uh, another 
And I didn't do it with this. It was a concert. Mm -hmm. I didn't play with the Chronos Quartet, mm -hmm. but they opened it and I did this thing. Yeah. That made me nervous. Yeah. That really, really made me nervous. Uh, he wrote a piece for solo trumpet that was so difficult. Oh, it was so hard. And uh, we did it in Carnegie Recital Hall, and I was very, very nervous. I don't know what kind of job I did. I think I can approach it with a different attitude now and do better. Mm. I really do. But it... It's funny that when you're not doing something for a while, it makes you nervous. When I'm playing live a lot, and then all of a sudden I have to record. If I'm not in front of the recording studio microphone, I get nervous in front of the recording studio microphone. Ah. If I'm playing in front of the recording studio microphone all the time, it's second nature. Then you go out and play live, you get nervous if you haven't played live in a while. But the classical thing, somehow I've always had a little bug about it. Hmm. About like it has to be perfect. Well, the definition of a mistake is, is much more, uh, you know, absolute in that kind of music. I don't know, but it, but it always just, uh, I just never, uh, uh, that's why I didn't go into the field. Mm -hmm. it, I, I never felt relaxed with it. I think I could go into it now because it's really the same thing as jazz. You just enjoy the music. Mm. The only thing that would stop me is the fact that uh, you, uh, in the classical thing, there's a there's a certain kind of thing necessary to play the notes that somebody else wrote and play them with very close to absolute accuracy. Uh, and um, then there's a certain kind of abandonment, abandonment that I want in my jazz playing. Mm -hmm. I want I want to have the abandonment to be able to play something, even if I can't play it, I go for it. Even if there's a, some line that strikes me and I know I can't play it, it doesn't matter. I'll still try to play it. And sometimes the intention of the line, whether it's played, sometimes it comes out. But sometimes the intention of the line, even if it doesn't come out, is exciting mm -hmm. to hear because the audience can pick up on the intent. Uh, and I find that if I practice too much for absolute accuracy and get my mind too much into that. In other words, if I've been playing a lot of precise lead trumpet, it usually takes me a few days to completely loosen up in my jazz playing again. Mm -hmm. As when I'm playing jazz, it'll usually take me a couple of rehearsals to focus in and get that lead thing just right. Different head. Yeah. The lead thing is more like playing classical music. Mm -hmm. What kind of head do you have to have on to be comfortable in these kind of jazz party situations? Improvising. Yeah. Just enjoy the music. Uh -huh. I think that's the, that's it. Uh, I just enjoy the music. The other thing is, uh, to me, is to realize that when you're playing with a rhythm section, stop thinking of yourself as a soloist and start thinking of the whole band as a group. And that way, you don't have to play every second. See, it's what, it's what you don't play that's also extremely mm. important, I think. In other words, if the rhythm section is really grooving, you can play two notes, you can lay out for seven beats, or 14 beats, you can lay out, and then come in with the right note, and it's very effective. If you're playing, so many players play almost continuous streams of eighth notes, and to me they all wind up sounding basically very much the same. Mm -hmm. And they do not excite me. There are some special players that play a lot of them, but they're few and far. You know, in other words, most people just either imitate that play that way, or they play you know, it's all technique and look how I can run through the changes. There's so much of that when people forget about the feeling and they forget about uh, 
time, really strong time, and they forget about melodic concept, horizontal concept. There's a lot of people that are thinking very vertically. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I could be biased since it's something I've never really taken to. Uh -huh. You know, it's never, since it's not excited me that much, I haven't gravitated to it and tried to learn it in great depth. Yeah. So, again, for educational purposes, I'm saying it's not sour grapes because I, I can't seem to force myself to, uh, to get into that. It's not, it's not my, uh, it's not my, uh, it's just not my love. For somebody whose love it is, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, uh, an example of somebody who can do that, but does it with great emotion to me in a model, well, of course, John Coltrane, but uh, somebody, you know, around today that does that and does it with great emotion and has it all to me is Dave Liebman. Absolutely incredible harmonic knowledge. Uh, can play all over the place. But you see, but David, in addition to playing a lot of notes at one time, well, he's, you know, he comes out of train. And if you listen to a great train solo, sometimes you hear a train playing a million notes but then, after playing all these courses of a million notes, he might all of a sudden land on one note or one note of, that has other harmonics in it or the particular mm -hmm. sound he's getting on it. And what is the most exciting peak of the whole solo? That is. And Miles is an example of somebody who, I mean, yeah, there's some records where he plays fast magnificently. But that really wasn't what it was. It's the sound that gets you. Mm -hmm. oh. You know? Yeah. So the right note in the right place is what it's all about. Well said. <laughs> you know? It's a great concept, simple concept. Um, one more spot I'd like to ask you. When you did uh, Feel it. Feel That's it. What I mean. Feel it. Okay. Um, in the BS and T days, was it tough? Was it tough uh, learning tunes because you had? I'm just guessing. Maybe you had half the band, the red music, and some of the guys in the band that didn't. Did those? They have a different way of learning. Everybody things? read music in that band. No kidding. Yeah. Well, I'll be done. Everybody could read well in that band. Hmm. Jimmy Fielder was the bass player. He was the hell of a musician. Yeah. All the horn players could read. Yeah. Uh, the guy. Oh, the only one who couldn't read well was Steve Katz. Uh huh. Hi, Steve. No, <laughs> so he couldn't read well, <laughs> but he played with a lot of feeling. Yeah. Whatever happened but he to wasn't Decaligan? A, nobody, no, everybody days. could read in the band. Yeah. Okay. DeCalligan? Where's he? DeCalligan's a studio musician, writer out on the West Coast. Okay. When you did the solo, on, great uh, musician, Lucretia McEvil. Did they make you play a bunch of them and then? Choose your. That solo was actually, oh God, that solo was so, there were so many punches in that solo. Uh, Bobby Columbia produced that tune, mm -hmm. and he would punch in here and punch in there, and that solo was very, very constructed by Bobby. Oh. You know, I mean, it was, you know, I, I like the way it came out, Yeah. but it was very constructed mm -hmm. by Bobby. And, uh, I always used to think that that was wrong, but I don't think it's so wrong. Uh -huh. I mean, I know, I don't want to mention names, I don't want to give it away, but there's a lot of incredible pop records that are made, and they're constructed that way. Yeah. Uh, my favorite playing for the record on that re uh, is just before they fade me out. Yeah. That's when, I start, that's when I start to really go. Yeah. On that. It's just before they fade me out. Uh -huh. I'd like to hear what I played after that. Right. But I bet the tapes good, are still around. I'm sure somewhere. they are. I'm sure they are. Yeah, that'd be a nice historical little artifact to get your, your alternate takes on that. Is it a struggle trying to keep things with record companies that, or find record companies that will 
record you. Oh, and of then course like, it is. Of course it is. Yeah. And of course the whole world is changing with, with the whole record industry now. Because the internet is changing that. Mm -hmm. You know, so... Um, what, you know... Um, who knows what's going to be going on and what the story is going to be now with records soon. You know what I mean? I mean, the internet could change the whole picture. We don't know. You think it's a positive thing? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Because I don't think artists, unless they became major stars and could, and, and could demand incredible deals, I don't think artists really ever got enough compared to what record companies got mm -hmm. uh, from royalties and stuff like that. I mean, there's all kinds of ridiculous stories. But rare is it that you ever recoup royalties from a record. They set it up that way. Yeah. You know, they just set it up that way. Um, and if you do your own CD, CDs, uh, it's trouble to set up a company. I mean, the biggest, the thing is, you can set up the company, but distribution, that's the hard one. There's still no way to have the power of distribution that a, that a major label could give you. You know? Or something like that. Yeah. Hmm. Have any words of advice for uh, young trumpet players or just musicians trying to break into the business these days? Yeah, I do. First of all, um, you have to decide what you want to do. Whether you want to be a, an instrumentalist, a trumpet player per se, or whether or not you want to, or whether you have a love of jazz to the point where you want to be a stylist. You have to decide what you want to do. Um, if you want to be a, you know, an in-demand cat, or, and I include women in that, mm -hmm. to play any kind of job for anybody, the key is versatility and very fast sight reading ability. There are people that, that learn to read lines ahead of where they're playing. Very few people have this ability, but some people do. Yes. Yeah. You know, culminating in maybe a whole page ahead, almost oh like photographing the page with your mind. But most people who can do that learned it when they were very small. Um, but it's a good thing to learn to read, if possible, a, a bar or two ahead, or even more if possible, than mm. where you're playing. It's a skill that's hard to develop. I don't have it. I read maybe a couple of beats ahead of where I'm playing or something. But um, if you can do that, if you can become a superb sight reader, <clears throat> if you want to become a horn for hire or a musician for hire, that's one of the prime things you need to do because people want to get people want to get if you want to record people have to get their stuff together right away right away and you you, you need to be a very quick learn mm -hmm. that way and reading helps a lot then there's another kind of musician who could be for hire musician as a side man and I think this combines with being a stylist where you may not have to read as well um, still have to be a good reader if you're going to play in somebody else's band because somebody else wants to do new material and if the whole band can learn the material in two hours and you need to spend four days learning it because you can't read if there's another person who plays as well as you they're going to get the job you know Yeah. Um, on the other hand if you're such a super excellent player that somebody wants your feeling on it you'll get the job even if you're a slow reader but that's rare exists but rare. Um, and then, if you're hooked on music and you want to really express yourself playing your music, you should start getting bands together, ensembles together, whatever it is you like to play, and you should start assuming the role of leadership at a young age and learn how to 
play your own music in your own group and how to get a whole concept of what you like, develop your whole concept mm -hmm. of what you like and go for it. Don't have any doubts about it. And the, other, the final piece of advice is that it's a very competitive field. Everybody would like to have a good time rather than go to work and do a job they don't like from nine to five. Yeah. So if you, so if you love it enough and you really want to do it, work really, really hard at it. Work really hard at it. And if you don't have the ability to do that, if you don't have the ability to work hard at it, uh, it's going to be a very dangerous field for you to make a, to make a living. Mm -hmm. well, There's no guarantee of making a good living anyway in it. Because right. it fluctuates, but but uh, in other words, the passion has to overcome all the possible problems. I mean, it's very possible to make a great living at it, also. But the passion has to overcome all these problems. It has to become more important than uh, than a comfortable, meaning rich, lifestyle. It has to be more important to you than that, and then you might get the rich lifestyle from it. Oh. That's great advice. Otherwise, don't go into it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, it's been a great pleasure talking to you My today. My pleasure to talk to you. And uh, best of luck in your future projects. And be interested to see where your name shows up next. Well, there should be a record coming out, hopefully, called Rainbow Mountain, which okay. is that funk fusion kind of groove. All right. Hopefully, somebody in America will pick it up. Yeah. Well, we will. We'll look for it. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.